I'll start off just as it relates to one of the uh, talks that you had bef before, which is getting to the issue in terms of diagnosis. So a patient presents with moderate asthma, peripheral blood eosinophilia, mononeuropathy, pulmonary infiltrates, and sinusitis. What is the diagnosis? Churg Strauss EGPA, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, or cannot make a diagnosis based on details given or give. <clears throat> See what people say. Okay, so uh, a lot of rheumatologists here. Um, and so, you know, when you see uh, those features, you think immediately that this is going to be uh, Churg stress or EGPA. But in fact, uh, those, all those manifestations can be manifest in uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and in hyper eosinophilic syndrome, as I'll show you. And it can be very, very hard to make a diagnosis and distinct, distinguish them. And you could ask the question, well, does it matter? And it may or may not matter. Uh, you know, what, what's really at the heart of all of this uh, uh, is the eosinophil and where it involves and how deeply it affects the tissue. Um, so, uh, but the truth is, is that while those criteria do seem like they're all EGPA, uh, frankly, you can have chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, which is commonly associated with asthma, eosinophilia, pulmonary infiltrate, and sinusitis, and neuropathy can present in that context as well. And hyper eosinophilic syndrome, where there's eosinophilia, and fills everywhere can also present in the same way. So you, really my answer is you can't make a diagnosis based on that. Since I was asked to talk about biologics, I thought I would just do a little primer just to see how educated people are in terms of uh, current biologic therapy. Which of the following is not an FDA approved biologic agent? And first of all, can you pronounce any of these? I can pronounce them, so I'll go, so there's omalizumab, mepolizumab, dupilumab, reslizumab, and benralizumab. Which of these is not approved? Okay, so again, we're in a rheumatology uh, audience. So, uh, so the two most common, so there's omalizumab, which has been uh, actually, which is, uh, I'll go to the next slide, which is also called Zolair. It's been approved for asthma uh, since 2003, 2004. Uh, mepolizumab is Nucala. It's, an, it's uh, a therapy that was just approved in 2013. Uh, dupilumab, or Dupixent, was actually approved uh, last Wednesday for... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's, well, you know, it was in the news. You know, if any of you read something other than, uh, you know, the Annals of Rheumatology, you may have seen it. Uh, but it's, it's a blockbuster drug for atopic dermatitis, but also has potential impact in uh, asthma and other uh, disease entities. Uh, Reslizumab uh, is, was approved a year ago for asthma, and Benralizumab has been submitted to the FDA. It's not yet approved, but it's another drug that's being considered for asthma, as well as other entities, as I'll discuss. Here's one other question. Let's just try to engage you guys a little bit. Um, which of the following monoclonal antibody targets is incorrect? Tralicinumab, oh, that's another one, by the way. Tralicinumab, IL-17. Mepolizumab, IL-5. Dupilumab, IL-4, IL-13. Reslizumab, IL-5. Benralizumab, IL-5, receptor. And omalizumab, IG. I'm going to take up all my 30 minutes with questions here. But it's good to see you. Maybe I can educate you guys a little bit. Let's see what people say. Wow, you guys are pretty good. So tralicinumab is, a, is an experimental anti-IL-13 agent. Uh, the rest of them, uh, you know, Mepo and uh, Reslizumab are anti-IL-5 antibodies. Benralizumab is an IL-5 receptor antagonist. Omalizumab blocks Ig and dupilumab, which is that atopic dermatitis drug, which also should have a huge impact on asthma. Uh, it reduces exacerbations by like 80%. Uh, it blocks both IL-4 and it blocks the IL-4 receptor, which also blocks IL-13. So the wrong answer is tralicinumab, which is an IL-13 blocker. So in terms of uh, uh, Churg-Strauss and EGPA, uh, this is a slide that I created back in 1997 when I first made a diagnosis of this, and I show this every time because I was, as a pulmonologist, I would think of this as an eosinophilic lung condition. And uh, I considered uh, EGPA the nexus of asthma, eosinophilia, and vasculitis. 
and it uh, occupies this you know, space that is really at the nexus that really crosses the lines of pulmonologists, allergists, uh, rheumatologists, and, and uh, so forth. But it really, the key characteristic there is that there's the presence of all three of these major features, but it is one of the hyper eosinophilic syndromes. And I didn't fully appreciate what the hyper eosinophilic syndromes were until about 10, 12 years ago when I was invited to the International Eosinophil Society. Are there any other members here? The IES? <laughs> We, we meet every two years or so, and like, uh, we alternate between North America and somewhere else in the world. Uh, this summer, we're going to Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, but we go over and we discuss important eosinophilic issues. There's like 250 eosinophilo nerds. Um, and, uh, and we came up with, you know, like what's the differential diagnosis of hyper eosinophilic syndrome? And uh, it's important to recognize that there's this whole broad world of hyper eosinophilic syndromes. There are myeloproliferative variants that derive from the bone marrow, some of which are associated with this FIP1L1 PDGFR alpha fusion protein, or the CHIC2 deletion you may have heard of. Uh, there's lymphoproliferative variants. There's benign hyper eosinophilia, episodic hyper eosinophilia, familial hyper eosinophilia, and then you know, there's associated overlap conditions, and Church, Strauss, or EGPA is part of these associated conditions that have a defined entity in association with hyper eosinophilia. So one more question, I think. Which of the following is an eosinophil? Let's see, there, there must be at least one pathologist in the room, right? based on the question that was asked before. So let's get your questions in here. You got two more seconds. Let's see how good we are. Oh, good, okay, good. So I see that we have no pathologists in the audience. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's good, uh, and at least uh, Peter Merkel probably put number nine. I don't know if Peter's here, so there we go. Very, very young eosinophil. Yeah, very, uh, yeah. It, I would say it's an immature eosinophil. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, so uh, the correct answer is three, uh, and these are the different kinds of cells. So you all need to go back to histology. I can see how much of an impact it's had on your academic careers. Um, but uh, what distinguishes uh, the eosinophil is uh, the presence of these pink granules and uh, the bilobed nucleus. And it's important to recognize, not that any of you ever look in a microscope, but uh, for, you know, when you send tissue off, they're going to want to be looking for uh, these eosinophils. And the characteristic features of uh, EGPA are the vasculitis and the eosinophilic infiltration with fibrinoid necrosis and histiocytes and the marked extra vascular eosinophilia that's present associated with EGPA. And eosinophils are important because uh, they interact with all these other cells. You can see the eosinophil is in the middle. Uh, I don't know if there's a pointer here. Here we go. There's a pointer. Um, uh, there's an eosinophil in the middle, and you can see there releases all these different cytokines that interact with all sorts of different cells, B cells, mast cells, smooth muscle cells, epithelial cells, and I, I call these uh, confusograms because there's all these confusing arrows going in all sorts of different directions. But you can see the importance of, uh, of eosinophils, and since eosinoph the reason I show this is because we know that eosinophils are involved in eGPA, maybe we can target one of these specific entities uh, to try to treat eGPA. And I'll just get back to the point that Rula made before about how we view eGPA uh, as pulmonologists versus rheumatologists. And, and that also gets to sort of the way we think about treatment and the definitions of relapses and things like that. But I view that the rheumatologists, all of you guys out there, view this as a vasculitis predominantly, which happens to have eosinophilia, asthma, and ankypositivity, and a flare is a flare of vasculitis. But uh, and, and I think this was reflected by the former ACR criteria, the 1990 ACR criteria, which are classification criteria, not diagnostic criteria. But over the last like 25 years, people have been using these as diagnostic criteria, which I think is a mistake. They, th these are meant to be in the context of vasculitis. You use these to help make a definition of eGPA. And we saw the updated uh, 2012 or 2013 uh, Chapel Hill uh, discussion, which I think reflects uh, some of those findings. From a pulmonary perspective, you know, I, I you see these patients and the allergists see these patients, we say, oh, okay, this person's got asthma, and then they 
have on top of that eosinophilia and vasculitis, maybe they've got ANCA. But you know, primarily this is like an asthma kind of disease, which happens to have vasculitis and eosinophilia, and that's what distinguishes it. And the flare can be one of asthma or vasculitis. And I, I know that in the prior talk there was discussion about how these things came about, and we'll talk about the, out, these outcomes in, in the trials that we're doing. So we view uh, from the pulmonary algebra perspective, this is a continuum going from asthma to eosinophilic asthma to eosinophilic pneumonia to maybe uh, eGPA. And there's all these different organs that are involved. So we need to treat these people aggressively. Now, in order to treat these people, we need to think about the etiologies. And you know, the etiology remains unknown. Uh, we know about the ANCA association and the potential involvement with ANCA in a subset of patients. But clearly, not all patients uh, have ANCA positivity. And um, I think that's important to recognize that this is a somewhat heterogeneous disease. Uh, but there are also a lot of autoimmune features that we can try to capitalize on, allergic features immune complex features, T cell and humoral immunity, and there's all these cytokines that can be dysregulated. And I'll talk briefly about those uh, as we talk about management because there's really a role for biologics to intervene in some of those pathways. The current management, as you all know, generally revolves steroids, steroids, and more steroids. Um, but um, the problem is, is that uh, not all patients respond to steroids initially, and steroids alone don't work in a cohort of patients. And then when you get people down to lower doses of corticosteroids, many of them relapse, and even if you bump them up, you, know, you can't taper their steroids. So those are, as far as I'm concerned, the major unmet needs for therapy, in addition to the fact that very few patients can get off of steroids, and that steroids, as you all know, uh, uh, have tremendous amount of side effects. So what do we do after steroids? So th these are the things that have been tried but you should know that there are no clinical trials out there for you know, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials for any of these entities. But a lot of the data for some of these comes from the literature from asthma. A lot of it comes from literature from other vasculitides. And so you know, methotrexate's been used in rheumatologic disease. It's also been used in asthma, azathioprine, and matinib, uh, which is uh, Gleevec, which has been used in a subset of patients with hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Uh, it's quite effective. And then anti-IgE and rituximab have been tried. Those are two monoclonals, and uh, I'm not going to really focus on those because the, the, the talk I was asked to give is about can biologics be used. Yeah, they can be used. People use anti-IgE for the asthma manifestations uh, and as steroid sparing agents when predominantly there are asthma and IgE mediated uh, toxicity associated with the disease. Uh, but Generally, it doesn't really get to the underlying component of the eosinophilia. Uh, rituximab, there have been a few case reports of efficacy, uh, particularly in ANCA-positive patients, which there is some efficacy, and then some of these other therapies. Cytoxan or cyclophosphamide is utilized for the more severe patients. Um, and uh, you know, I'll usually use uh, azathioprine, or I used azathioprine or methotrexate or mycophenolate, despite the paucity of data, just so that we could try to taper people's corticosteroids. The question is, is what about monoclonals? And the, what I'm gonna focus on is anti-IL-5, because there's a good rationale for targeting uh, IL-5 as a potential therapeutic target. So what are some of the rationales for targeting IL-5? Well, interleukin-5 is a cytokine that regulates eosinophil poiesis, as well as eosinophil tissue survival and eosinophil activation. And if we think that the common thread with all these patients is that they've got eosinophilia, then it's probably a good idea to target the eosinophil somehow. And uh, there have also been some data with regard to IL-5 in patients with eGPA. This is a study from over a decade ago that Bernard Helmish uh, published, uh, which uh, cells cultured with T cell uh, specific stimuli uh, it were, uh, were found to show increased IL-5 secretion in eGPA patients compared to controls. So that suggested that maybe there was some role of IL-5. And there's also been some data suggesting that IL-5 promotes eosinophil adhesion to the, uh, to the vascular endothelium and other uh, components that may be associated with uh, induction of vasculitis. Now, there are three anti-L5s that are being studied, uh, two of which were approved. Mepolizumab was approved in November of 2015. Reslizumab uh, was approved in March of 2016. So they've been available for eosinophilic asthma for about a year now, and we have a fair amount of experience in patients with uh, 
uh, eosinophilic asthma. And uh, those of us who are risk takers have also tried it in patients with eGPA. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that experience as well. Benralizumab blocks not the IL-5 that's circulating, but it binds to the IL-5 receptor. And uh, it's been submitted to the FDA. It's expected to have approval sometime later this year. But what's nice about uh, uh, benralizumab is because it binds the IL-5 receptor, it results in uh, antibody-dependent um, uh, cell cytotoxicity. Um, basically, the antibodies come in, bind to, the bind to the benralizumab on the receptor, and kill off the whole cell. It results in depletion of eosinophils as opposed to just blockade of IL-5 activity. So mepolizumab uh, is this drug that's been studied most, uh, in particular in eGPA, and it's a monoclonal antibody that binds IL-5, pretty high affinity. It reduces eosinophil numbers in a variety of hyper-eosinophilic syndromes. It's been studied in eosinophilic GI disease. It's been studied in hyper-eosinophilic syndromes. And uh, there was a paper published by Mark Rothenberg in 2008 uh, in which uh, in patients who were given mepolizumab, 750 milligrams IV. By the way, the dose that was approved in asthma, in asthma is just 100 milligrams sub-Q. Uh, but the, that dose that was published in New England Journal of Medicine eight year, 10 years ago um, resulted in significant reduction in steroid dosing. It still didn't get an indication uh, for hyper syndrome because the FDA didn't like the outcome of steroid reduction. They thought it was too subjective and doctors weren't blinded to eosinophil counts and things like that, which we've taken into account in our subsequent trials. Mepolizumab has also been studied significantly in asthma, and this was a paper published in New England Journal by Param Nair and Paula Byrne, colleagues from McMaster's uh, in Canada. Um, and uh, this was a study of patients who had high sputum eosinophils in asthma, and they showed that mepolizumab reduced exacerbations of asthma significantly uh, compared to patients who were given placebo. Small cohort, just 20 patients, but you know, got into the New England Journal uh, because the signal was so uh, significant and because there was a companion article, the same issue, the New England Journal, by a British group, by Ian Pavard and, uh, and uh, uh, Pranab uh, Haldar and colleagues, and they showed in the same issue, slightly, slightly larger cohort, 30 patients versus 30 patients, again, mepolizumab significantly reduced asthma exacerbations. This led to a larger study looking at different doses, and uh, even though the initial study looked at 750 milligrams, 250 and 75 milligrams did qu just as well, almost quite as well, uh, given uh, subcutaneously in a cohort of patients with asthma. So while these studies were going on, I, I was seeing a lot of eGPA patients, and I had a curious fellow, and I said, you know, why don't we test this in a cohort of patients who have got eGPA? And we uh, did a, um, a, a study, an open-label study, in which we took patients who had eGPA, or trick strauss based on the American College Rheumatology Criteria, that, because that was the best thing we had, um, and uh, who were on more than 10 milligrams a day of prednisone. We said, well, you know, th those are the patients who really have an unmet need. If we're going to try something experimental, let's do it in people who are on more than 10 milligrams a day of prednisone and who have been unable to taper before. And uh, we just wanted to get a signal to see how effective this therapy was. So we gave just four doses, four monthly doses of mepolizumab uh, over a four-month period of time. Then we watched them for another 18 weeks or so. And um, we allow them to taper their steroids according to a, a steroid tapering schedule. We had uh, seven females, three males, they were all Caucasian. The mean age was 45, which is consistent <clears throat> with what we see with eGPA in general. And they were on about 14 milligrams a day of prednisone. And three of those 10 were also on methotrexate, and that was, that was allowed as long as they continued throughout the trial. And what we saw was, and these are all the 10 patients, was that there was significant reduction in eosinophil counts right from the get-go. As soon as we gave them their first shot of mepolizumab, their eosinophil counts came down. When we stopped therapy, starting at around 20 weeks or so, uh, you know, about eight weeks later, eosinophil counts started to rise uh, significantly. In terms of efficacy, this was, I think, the most important thing, was we were able to start tapering steroid dose, and only... During, while patients were getting treatment, there were only two exacerbations uh, over the 12-week um, period of time uh, that were associated with asthma and sinuses. One person went 
to like her aunt who had a bad cat and, uh, and got like an asthma flare then went up on her steroids. Uh, but what was interesting was once we stopped the therapy was people began to have a huge number of flares. And this is reflected by uh, their prednisone doses. So what we found was these exacerbations that were predominantly um, uh, asthma-related, sinus-related. There were also some GI symptoms associated with it, as well as worsening arthritis. Uh, but there were only three exacerbations uh, uh, while the people were getting treatment, and then 21 exacerbations in the post-treatment period. But people were able to get down their steroid dose from 14 milligrams down to 3.5 milligrams during that short period of time. So a 75% reduction in steroid dose. And people were saying, like, when can I get this drug again? Um, while this study was going on, there was another study in Europe that was going on that Frank Musig and colleagues did, basically found the same thing. They gave meplizumab to 10 patients as well. They also gave it intravenously, 750 milligrams. And these patients all did quite well as well. They had uh, rem uh, reached remission, nine, nine patients reached remission. Their steroid dose was significantly uh, reduced. They had no significant adverse events. And uh, these patients did quite well. So based on these data, we then hypothesized that compared with placebo, anti-L5 therapy would safely provide eGPA patients with a novel steroid sparing treatment option that would reduce exacerbations, decrease serum markers of disease, and allow for safe steroid tapering. So we collaborated with uh, the NIH and GlaxoSmithKline to develop the MIRA study, which was mepolizumab treatment in relapsing or refractory eGPA. I came up with a more colorful uh, uh, um, design, but everyone vetoed me. But this was nice because this was a really nice example. And frankly, the only other one that I know of was uh, another one by the vasculitis group, uh, where there was nice collaboration between NIH and industry, and I got a, you know, funding from the NIH to do mechanistic studies and to pay for some of the clinical work in our group. And we, there, the, 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 uh, the industry partner uh, said, well, we want to make this a registry trial. We want to do a large study. And so uh, just to give you a history, this took a while because uh, the first patient who got mepolizumab with eGPA was in 2009, uh, and it wasn't until uh, mid 2013 that we actually started the trial, and we just completed our trial uh, about six months ago, in the end of 2016. So from the first patient getting as a concept to going through a clinical trial took seven years or so, um, and we have yet to publish results, so I'm not going to share the results, but I will talk about the study design. I'm embargoed from discussing the study while it's uh, still in consideration for uh, and going to be published in the next several weeks, so that's the only thing I can share with you is that at some point in the next few months it'll be uh, uh, hopefully published. Um, so the study design that we employed for this study was we gave um, 300 milligrams. Now the approved dose for eGPA for hyperesinophilic asthma is 100 milligrams, um, but we decided, well, this is a bit more of an eosinophilic syndrome, and the prior study was we, that we did use 750, so we went somewhere in between based on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug. We thought this would be appropriate. So we gave 300 milligrams plus standard of care uh, or placebo plus standard of care to about 130 patients monthly for about a year, uh, 48 weeks with a 12-week follow-up. And uh, we had a hard time trying to figure out exactly which patient population we were going to target. We ended up powering the study for 130 patients, and we decided we weren't going to go after the most severe patients who had uh, organ or life-threatening disease because they could mess up the study results. And we weren't going to go with the patients who were the milder cohort, which represent about 40% of patients who are on less than 7.5 milligrams a day. What we want to focus on where the biggest unmet need was, with, with, where there was the most likely uh, place to see a response, which was those patients who are on more than 7.5 milligrams a day who had relapsing or refractory disease but didn't have organ or life-threatening disease. And the diagnosis, diagnostic criteria that we used for inclusion, uh, Rula already uh, mentioned, but it's basically people who had eGPA for at least six months based on history of asthma plus eosinophilia, uh, usually more than 1,000 or uh, 10%, uh, and at least two of the following features that were already reviewed. But basically, if you had asthma, eosinophilia, and then two other things consistent with eGPA, you were able to get in the trial. Now, you could theoretically get in the trial with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, because if you had asthma, eosinophilia, pulmonary infiltrates, and cyanonasus abnormality, that's frankly 
um, uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, and, but that is what we see, and we want to be as inclusive as possible, and we want to get the study done as quickly as possible, and we thought it was pertinent regardless of whether or not people had, you know, evidence of palpable purpose or cardiac toxicity. Uh, but people did need to have a history of relapsing or refractory disease, and they needed to be on more than 7.5 milligrams a day of prednisone. And they were allowed to be on an immunosuppressive other than cyclophosphamide, as long as they were willing to continue it throughout the study. So we enrolled 136 patients, and we did it actually in record time. We were able to enroll uh, yeah, 59 patients in the U.S., and then another... Uh, what is that, 77 patients uh, uh, throughout the rest of the world. And uh, we did this, we enrolled in about a year. So that tells you, A, there's a huge population out there that's captive and it's looking for answers, but we were able to enroll these people quite quickly. And the co-primary endpoints that we looked at were total accrued duration of remission over the 52 weeks um, and the proportion of patients who were in remission at both weeks 36 and 48 of the study treatment period. We also looked at time to eGPA relapse. We looked at average steroid dose. Uh, we uh, looked at the proportion of patients who were able to achieve remission within the first 24 weeks, amongst other things. And then we looked at other outcomes, more pulmonary-centric outcomes, uh, like eosinophil counts, lung function, asthma symptom scores, and then we looked at a whole host of safety metrics. Um, we also, what was exciting about this study was that we looked at a whole host of exploratory mechanistic uh, things that we're still doing. Uh, because we just uh, unlocked the database for the clinical results about a month ago. But we did collect biomarkers throughout. We collected blood, we collected sputum, um, and uh, we're going to be doing biomarker analyses, different cytokines, uh, chemokines, neutrophil studies, and gene expression profiling. And hopefully that'll shed some light onto not just how this drug works, but also into the pathophysiology of eGPA. Um, these are some of the sites, and uh, some of the people are represented here, including uh, Ulrich and Peter and Carol, amongst others. I don't know if anybody else is here who participated in this study. But it was quite a heroic effort to get uh, the, these 60 patients and do the mechanistic pieces. I, I can't share the results, as I said, and I, you know, just sort of the timing of the meeting. But hopefully, uh, I, I, could, I, I think I can say to you, because there was a press release, that the study was positive. Uh, meaning that we did have a, a, a good result, uh, and, um, uh, and we're looking forward to presenting all those data in greater detail. Uh, I will also say that we're looking at two of the other anti-IL-5s, uh, resolizumab and benrolizumab, and we just signed the contracts for these two studies in the last week. These are going to be open-label studies which capitalize on the role of IL-5, and if anybody wants to send patients to Denver or somehow collaborate with me, I'd be happy to entertain uh, that notion. But I do think that these drugs do show a significant amount of promise for the management of eGPA in general. Um, and, uh, and I do think that they, just as I showed you in the pilot study, that there is a potential to demonstrate efficacy. So I'll just sum up by saying that I think that obviously eGPA is a challenging disease entity uh, and there's lots of morbidity. But uh, we also know that current therapies are generally uh, ineffective in terms of causing complete disease remission and preventing complete relapses, or the ones that we do have, steroids and cyclophosphamide, et cetera, they are associated with morbidity. Targeting the eosinophil is a very rational approach. The, our study, the MIRA study, assessed efficacy in this patient population compared to placebo, and those results will be coming out soon, so be a little bit patient. Uh, but there are other novel biologics that are on the way, resolizumab, benrolizumab, uh, and then some of the other ones, like dupilumab, may also have some role and I think need to be studied as well. I do think that the mechanistic studies will really shed some light on all of these uh, different aspects of underlying pathophysiology and treatment, and uh, it's important to recognize that you can do collaborative work with the NIH and with industry, and I think that sets an example for how things should move forward in the future.